We're on the tabernacle tonight, and um, we're studying the coverings. Now, last week we hit on the goat's hair, uh, showing that um, the covering there and what it symbolized as a sin offering and a sin bearer. Christ was our sin bearer. And we also looked at the ram skin dyed red. Um, and that also pictures the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ connected to the ministry of the priest and connected to the burnt offering. Now I want you to notice something as we look at that. Go back to Exodus chapter 25 real quick. Uh, something I don't know if I pointed out, but if I didn't, I want to make sure I point that out. Exodus 25. There's four coverings, and we're going to look at these in detail tonight as much as I can. Um, there's four coverings here. There is the ram skin dyed red. There's the badger skin. And there is the fine twine linen in verse 4. And then there's the goat skin. There's four coverings, okay? And... So we're looking at these coverings in detail, and I'm going to show you the double application here. Now tonight, we're going to look at the badger skin, and then I'm going to put all these together here with some additional notes. So we're going to go back and revisit the other three. Um, let's go back over here now. The badger is an animal that lives in the ground, the earth. Okay, The badger is the animal used to represent the sinless humanity of Christ. We see that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And it shows us that God clothed himself in a human body and partook of our humanity. The badger skin also is used to clothe the tabernacle. And it is um, the, the last covering. It's on the outside. And we're going to look at that in detail later and show you what that pictures as far as you as a believer. But the badger skin is used to clothe the tabernacle on the outside. If you want to look at some verses on that, let's go to Exodus 26. Exodus 26, verse 14. Verse 14. Thou shalt make a covering for the tent of ram skin dyed red and a covering above of badger skin. The badger skin is going to be the outside covering, okay? And um, let's see, let me go through here. It's on the outside. It's used to cover that outside part of that thing. Now, go to Revelation 21.3. Revelation 21.3. Look at this. In verse uh, 3, the Bible says this. It says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Notice that he, in the end, becomes that outer covering. He is what is wrapped around them. He's that tabernacle, okay? So that's what you see there in Revelation chapter 21. Now, let's go a little further here. Let's look at the shoe bread and how it connects to this. Go to Numbers chapter 4. It is the badger skin that is used to cover the shoe bread, numbers. Oops. Chapter 4, and we're going to look over here at verse 7. And upon the table of shoe bread, they shall spread a cloth of blue and put there on the dishes and the spoons and the bowls and covers to cover with all, and the continual bread shall be their own. They shall spread upon them a cloth of scarlet, and cover the same with a covering of badger skins, and shall put in the staves thereof. 
So there you have the badger skin covering the shoe bread. Now let's go to John chapter 6 verse 33. Let's see what Jesus says about himself in relationship to that. John 6, 33. He says this in verse 33. He says, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. So Jesus Christ is your covering as far as the table of shoe bread is. He becomes that shoe bread. When he took on human form, He's showing you there's a covering there where he's offering that shoe bread, but that shoe bread is on the inside of him. What's covering the inside of him? His humanity. You see that? He's covering that offering that he's giving to you. So he becomes that covering there. These are all types. Look at the altar. Go to number four, uh, Numbers chapter 4. In Numbers chapter 4, verse 11. In Numbers 4, 11, the Bible says, And upon the golden altar they shall spread a cloth of blue and cover it with a covering of badger skin and shall put to the staves thereof. Now notice that. That badger skin is covering the altar. Let's see what the Bible says about that altar in Hebrews. Go to Hebrews chapter 13. And we're going to go down here to verse 10. 13, 10. Now notice in verse 10 it says, We have an altar. Whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For, he, for here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come." Now, there's two things there that you could link to the covering there that he's comparing there. You could either say that it's Jesus himself or the blood that he applied. Okay? And he's saying, let us go without the camp bearing. That gives you the picture of those uh, priests putting that stave on their shoulders and bearing up that, um, that altar and, and bearing up the tabernacle itself even. And Jesus is saying here, or Paul is saying here in Hebrews, that he is our altar. Okay? So he's the covering there as well. Okay? Jesus becomes the covering just like he becomes the head like we talked about this morning. Alright? Now let's look at the candlestick. You're going to see a pattern here show up. Numbers chapter 4. If you haven't already seen it. That badger skin is important. sense it pictures the sinless humanity of Jesus Christ and another sense it pictures your sinful nature <laughs> there's the double application just to give you a hint on where we're going with it look over here at um, numbers 4 9 numbers chapter 4 we'll start with verse 9 it says in verse 9 it says and they shall take a cloth of blue and cover the candlestick of the light and his lamps and Notice it uses the term his, his lamps, and his tongs, and his snuff dishes, and all the oil vessels thereof, wherewith they minister unto it. And they shall put it in all the vessels thereof within a covering of badger skin, and shall put it upon a bar. Notice that badger skin shows up again, even with the candlesticks. Now, let's go to the New Testament again and see how that connects to Jesus Christ. Go to John chapter 9. One of the things you're going to figure out about the Bible is it's a puzzle. Mm -hmm. 
And you just got to figure out where the pieces belong. And once you see where the pieces belong, you'll get to get the big picture. Jesus said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Picturing that candlestick. So he's the true candlestick. If he's the true candlestick, if he's the true light, that he cover, he's the covering of that thing in the tabernacle that he it pictured him. His humanity covers that. See, when Jesus came into flesh, they could not see the truth of the candlestick because it was covered in badger skin. They could not see the truth of the altar. It was covered in that badger skin. They could not see the truth of all these things that we're talking about here. The shoe bread, the tabernacle itself, and the, um, the Ark of Testimony, the altar, the candlestick. We didn't even hit the Ark of the Testimony. We'll go back and look at that. But all of those things... Jesus Himself is presenting to the people, but you have to have spiritual discernment to see it. You've got to go past that badger skin and look down into that blue part where Christ is. And the only way you're going to see that is when the Holy Ghost reveals it to you because it is covered. That's why the world can't understand what we talk about when we talk about things in the church and the spiritual things. You have to be born again to understand it. The minute you get saved, you start understanding the truth that's in this book right here. Now let's go back and look at the ark. Let's go back and look at the ark. Let's go back in Numbers 4 again. The ark itself is covered. Numbers chapter 4, we're going to go down here to verse 9. No, excuse me, not 9. We're going to go down here to verses 5 and 6. Chapter 4, verses 5 and 9, uh, excuse me. Yeah, chapter uh, 4, verses 5 and 6. And when the camp set it forward, Aaron shall come and his sons, and they shall take down the covering veil and cover the ark of testimony with it, and shall put thereon the covering of badger skin, and shall spread over it a cloth holy of blue, and shall put in the stage there. Notice that there's two things that they're, they're put there. They, the first thing they put down is that what? That blue. What's that picture? Heaven. Jesus said, I am from above. You are from beneath. John, when he saw Jesus Christ, he said he is above all. He came from above. Well, what do you do when you go out there in the middle of the day and you look up? What do you see? You see blue. Right? Right? The only way you can't see it at night is because the light ain't on it. But when the light's on it, you see it. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. When you look at the thing through the light of God or through the light of Jesus Christ, you can see it for what it is. But see, the world is looking at it at nighttime. All they see out here is black. See? They don't see the blue. They don't see heaven. They don't see Jesus. All they see is the dark. Because they live in the dark. They grope around in the darkness. That's why people out here in uh, the nightclubs, they, they turn the lights down low. If they, you ever wonder why they do that? Turn the lights down low, you go into these uh, joints and they, it's, everything's dark. Right? Turn the lights down. Put the light on the thing, you see the thing for what it really is. They don't want you to see it for what it really is. So they put the lights down low. See? All right, let's keep going. The Bible says here, these all represent Christ and give us a picture that He was clothed in humanity for our redemption and you have to see it through the prism of Jesus Christ to see what's underneath it. Okay? That's the first thing. All right? The badger skins also covered the lamps the tongs, the snuff dishes, oil vessels, the instruments of ministry, the censers, the flesh hooks, the shovels, the basins, and all the vessels of the altar. These all represent different aspects of the body of Christ, the church. The badger skins clothe them as well, representing their vile bodies being changed and made like unto His glorious body, the body of Jesus Christ at the rapture of the church and being clothed with a body like His. See? 
Alright, let's look at some scriptures on that. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Alright, in Philippians chapter 3, look at verse 21. The Bible says, well, go back to verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when you look up, where is God at? Where's the Bible say He is at? North. He's, a, uh, he's up there. He's up north. So I can tell you exactly where heaven's at. I can point to it. Tonight. All you got to do is go stand outside and find the north star and point to it. That's where heaven's at. That's the direction we're going to go when the rapture happens. We're not going to go east. We're not going to go west. And we're certainly not going south. We're going north. It's an exact location. And the Bible says, here in verse 20, our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you looking for Him? All you got to do is go out down the middle of the daytime and look up and you see blue. Unless there's a storm. God designed it that way. So that you wouldn't miss it. Remember, the tabernacle pictures a spiritual reality and it also pictures the universe. So when you go outside and look outside in the daytime, you're seeing the tabernacle being displayed. Your finite mind and your finite eyes cannot see it all. So you only see a little small piece of it. Alright, the Bible says, Who shall change our vile body? Don't you make no mistake about it. It's vile. You wrestle with it every day, don't you? Don't you? Come on. you got sin in your life. and You struggle with it every day, right? Vile. This body, this body don't want to serve Jesus Christ. Amen. This body wants to do contrary to Jesus Christ. Amen. That's why this church house ain't full tonight. Because people serving their flesh instead of serving God. They gave in to their vile body. Amen. Your vile body needs to be put under and crucified. And one day it is going to be. Who shall change our vile body and make it uh, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. You want to find out what America serves? You want to find out what the people in this community serve? I'll tell you what you do next week. We get us a little sign up and we get it up on Facebook and we get on to different uh, social outlets and we put an announcement. For every person that comes to church, we're going to give you a $100 bill. And you know what? You couldn't put everybody in this building next week. Amen. You know what that tells you? Your God is money. Amen. Amen. How about this one? You tell everybody next week, for everybody that comes to church, we're going to serve you a filet mignon. <laughs> After the service, you just all you got to do is show up. You know what you'd find out? You'd find out their God is their belly. I'll tell you something else. You tell somebody, and you make the same announcement next week, and you say, look, you come to church next week, we're going to teach you the Word of God, and we're going to show you what the Bible says about the tabernacle. And just see what happens. You know what's the problem? They don't love Jesus Christ. You can use the gimmicks to get them in. But you know what? When you start using the gimmicks to get them in, you've got to use the gimmicks to keep them. And that's what the preachers have done in this country. They've started giving in to the gimmicks of the world to get people in church. And now they're having to use the gimmicks to keep them there. I don't mean to preach tonight, but, um, <laughs> but that's the truth. Alright, the Bible says He'll change your vile body, that it may fashion, be fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to the working whereby He's able to subdue all things unto Himself. Alright, take your Bible and go to 1 John. Chapter 3. Look at verses 2 and 3. Look at verse 1. 
Actually, go back. let's start at verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. 1 John. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Where Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, listen to it. Now, and I don't mean next week, I mean now, are we the sons of God? You do not become a son of God after your death. You become a son of God at your new birth. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you trust Him and the finished work that He did at Calvary for your sin atonement, that moment that you put your faith and trust in Him, you become the Son of God in that moment. As many as receive Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. The Bible says, Now we the sons of God, and it not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, but we shall see Him as He is. And every man that hath this hope in Him purifieth himself even as he is pure. He don't continue to wallow around in the filth of the world. There's a change in his heart and it will cause him to have a desire to have a change in his life. I have a problem with people that claim to be saved and there's no fruit that tells me they're saved. Amen. Amen. Oh, I love Jesus, preacher. Do you come to church? Nope. Do I read the Bible? Nope. Do you pray? Nope. Do I... I mean... Give me something, man. Not just lip service. Do you love the Lord? Yep. Prove it. I mean, if the thing quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, looks like a duck, smells like a duck, the thing's probably a duck. And I'll tell you something. We got a strange thing going on in Christian churches today. We got a lot of people in church that talk one way and live another, and we are supposed to count them as born again Christians, and I have a problem with that. Me too, brother. I have a problem with that. A changed man is going to purify himself. That's what it says right there. It says, And every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself. I'll tell you what happened. I can't tell you that this is what happens to everybody. But I can tell you what happened to me when I got saved. You ready? Every time the doors were open, I wanted to be there. It was not a drag. It was not a drudge. It was not a chore. It was not a problem. It was not a, oh my God, I can't wait to... Yeah, I, 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 was, I couldn't wait to get there, brother. Amen. Sunday night, Sunday morning, Wednesday, revivals, gospel scenes, potluck dinners, it didn't matter. I wanted to be around God's people. you got Christians today that can't wait to get out of church. So call them. And you have to beg them and drag them to the church. What a shame. You're going to have something to ask to for the judgment seat. Don't you worry. God's got your number. The Bible says every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself. Some things you got to do in yourself. You got to separate yourself from the world. You got to separate yourself from the things that drag you down into gutter. You got to cut some ties off that are toxic to you. Take your Bible and let's go to another one. First Thessalonians. I'm going to preach a message on this soon on separation. And boy, you're going to talk about tanning some hives. First Thessalonians chapter 4. You better fasten your seatbelt on that one. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Sometimes we've got to get that heat going kind of a little bit hot there to wake some people up. They're lukewarm. God said, I want you hot or cold. I can't stand a lukewarm person. If you ain't going to be on fire for Jesus, shut your mouth. Amen. Amen. Don't tell everybody else how they ought to live when you ain't living it. I get tired of that too. People running around telling everybody else how they ought to be and they can't even do it themselves. Amen. A bunch of self-righteous hypocrites. 1 Thessalonians <coughs> chapter 4. The Bible says in verse 4 that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in what? And what? Sanctification. Sanctification. Let's stop right there. Let's park that for a minute. Sanctification. What is sanctification? Separation. 
but separation from this over here unto this over here. You can't straddle the fence. You're either here or you're here. You're either for us or you're against us. You can't ride the middle. You can't look like you're serving God one minute and look like you're in the world the next. You need to be separated, changed, so that when people see you, they know you've been with Jesus. And that includes your garments. That includes your conversation. That includes your language. I have a problem with Christians that claim to be saved and use profanity. Amen. It sickens me to my stomach to listen to Christians tell me they love Jesus Christ and they blaspheme Him by using profanity. If your heart's clean, your mouth will be clean. If your heart's dirty, your mouth will show it. Amen. Alright, sanctification, and what's the next thing he says? And honor. Now, you are a person of honor or dishonor? When I was in the Marine Corps, that was a big thing. You wear that uniform with honor. You didn't wear that uniform half halfway. You didn't do that. You wore it with honor knowing that when your drill instructor came or your officer came and inspected you, he could give you a pat on the back and say, well done. But if he came in and you all, you look like you just crawled out of bed, wrinkled, that's the way a lot of Christians look spiritually, look like you just crawled out of bed, you know, barely can make it, brother, barely can make it. They think because they went to church on Sunday morning, they did God a service. They did God a favor. You didn't do God a favor. He done you a favor by not knocking you into hell. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you ought to show some gratitude. Praise God. Honor. Honor. Alright, let's look at the next one here. Second, Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. And look at verse 20. Verse 20, the Bible says, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. At the judgment seat of Christ, that's exactly what's going to happen. There's going to be a lot of Christians stand up there naked and be in shame because they were ashamed of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is going to have to look at them and look at his Father and say, I'm ashamed of you. You dirty rascal. I gave you food. I gave you clothes. I gave you money. I gave you a car. I gave you a house. I gave you a job. I gave you health. I gave you all the pleasures of life. And you couldn't even open your mouth and proclaim my name. You dirty rascal. The Bible says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, what's to these? Well, you have to read up above that and read and find out. If any man purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel of honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Now here's something for you young people. Fully also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now you young people that are listening to me, keep yourself pure. Keep yourself holy. God expects you as a born again Christian to keep your body clean and keep it holy before Him. That means you can't go along with the world and go out there fornicating. That means you can't go out there hanging out in the nightclubs with them using profanity and getting out there and doping yourself up and drugging yourself up and getting sloppy drunk and looking like a fool because that's exactly what you are. Live holy before the Lord. Give your heart to Christ in every area. Amen. The Bible says you need to keep your heart pure. You need to keep your uh, body clean and prepared for marriage. If you love her enough to sleep with her, you ought to marry her. Amen. And if she's not willing to marry you, then she's nothing but a harlot. And she ain't got no interest in your love. 
That goes for the man too. If he's not willing to put a ring on that finger, young lady, he is not worth having. Your body is holy, sacred, a temple of God. Amen. Tabernacle. We're on the tabernacle tonight. Don't you worry. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And look at verse 7. Look at verse 7 here. The Bible says, But we have this treasure. See that thing? And where is it at? In. Inside. So you're walking around in a badger skin right now. People look at you and say, You're a son of God? You don't look like no son of God to me. <laughs> well, you're looking at the badger skin. But see, there's something on the inside of me. Jesus lives on the inside. You got to get down on the inside to find out where the gold is. The Bible says, "Yeah, where, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us." All right, take your Bible and let's look at another one. They're all in here. First Corinthians chapter fifteen. Look at verse uh, thirty-five. Look at verses 35 through 58. He said, my goodness, we're going to read a lot there. We sure are. Look at verse 35. But some man will say, how are the dead raised? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest does not quicken except it die. And that which, it, which thou soweth, thou soweth not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God, watch this. Pay attention to this verse. And this ought to motivate you to do something for Jesus Christ because depending on what you do for the Lord will determine what kind of body you come up with. The Bible says, but God giveth it a body as... What does that next part say? It hath pleased Him. Are you pleasing Him? Some people are going to come up with a shabby looking body. <laughs> And the Bible says that your body is going to come up according to how you please the Lord. Some of you are going to come up looking like Superman. And some of you are going to come up looking like Batman. And some of you are going to come up looking like Snoopy. Amen. <laughs> Amen. The Lord is the Lord. You, you, you're going to look, just barely make it in, boy. Amen. The Bible says that it hath pleased him and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another of beasts, another of fish, and another of birds. There are celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. Now you can argue in verse 41 that that is a reference to the different dispensations and the different ways that people come up in the resurrection depending on what dispensation sensation they're in. So also is the uh, resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul. The last man was made a quickening spirit. How be it? That was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth earthly, and the second man is the Lord from heaven. And is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly. And as is the heavenly, so are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. That's condition on whether you're born again. And for this I say, brethren, watch this now very carefully. Flesh and blood. You got it? Flesh and blood. That means that thing you're carrying around right now. That suitcase you're walking around in. That thing's not going to heaven. It can't stand the heat. God is a consuming fire. So you've got to have a body that can withstand the heat. So God's going to have to give you a spiritual body that can live forever in His presence. Because you're going to be living in the presence of eternal fire. See? 
and eternal light, pure light. You've never seen pure light before. You've seen filtered light. You've never seen pure light. You couldn't live if you saw pure light. The Bible says, Behold, uh, what, verse 50 rather, But this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be what? Changed. Changed. Going through a dress rehearsal. In a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, and I don't mean Donald Trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal shall, must put on immortality. So when this corruptible hath put on incorruption, and this mortal hath put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying which is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Now notice those things. Alright, he continues. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The, th the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. So a man that don't get saved is still under the law. He can't make it under the law. And he can't make it under the law. You're going to hell if you uh, try to live by the law and get to heaven. You can't get to heaven under the law. You know why? Because you can't keep the law. <laughs> Only one person ever kept the law. You know what it was? Jesus. So you have to ride on His righteousness or you ain't getting in. And every lost person in this country right now is under the law. And they'll stay under the law until they get saved. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. But if you reject Him, then God says, I'll keep you under the law and you'll have to stand according to that law when I judge you. And nobody yet has been able to pass the test. Got it? <laughs> Alright, the Bible says here in the next part, He says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Verse 57 says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you get through that. Alright, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and look at verse 15. Alright, verse 15 says this, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Okay? He is our covering. Alright, one more point that needs to be made here. The badger skins were not very appealing to look at, referring you back to an Old Testament prophecy concerning Christ. Go to Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52. I don't know if you've ever seen a badger skin. We're going to talk about it a little bit more on this board here in a minute when I give you the double application here. Right now we're giving you the first application as it applies to Jesus Christ. Isaiah 52, verse 4. In verse uh, 4, it says, For thus saith the Lord God, my, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian... Is that it? That ain't it. Hold on a minute. Where am I at here? I'm sorry. 52, 14. I was in the wrong verse. As many were astonished at thee, his vestige was so marred, more than any man... And his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see. And that which they had not heard shall they consider. Jesus Christ, when he's on the cross, he takes and becomes the sin offering. His body becomes so contorted 
and so marred and so twisted and mangled by the sin of the world that he's bearing that people, when they looked at him, they could not even tell he was a man anymore. Amen. Go to Isaiah chapter 53, next chapter over. The Bible says concerning Jesus when he's on the cross, who hath believed thy report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The arm of the Lord is Jesus Christ. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. That's Jesus on the cross. But look at verse um, 14 again of chapter 53. His vestige was so marred more than any man. Now you think about that. I preached a message here a while back, I don't know if you remember it or not, about how Jesus became the burnt offering and the sin offering and the Passover. And when he was on the cross, he was set on fire of God. That's a real deal. He went through hell on that cross so that you wouldn't have to. People still don't honor him. People still don't honor him, brother. That's it. What a shame. What a shame. Badger skin. Alright. His true beauty was behind that external. Now, as I was doing some more study on this this week, I come up with some other things on this coverings that I want to share with you. The coverings of the tabernacle have a double application as to the meaning and symbolism. The coverings for the tabernacle picture something about you as a born-again believer. And here we're going to look at it up here on this board here. Number one, let's go back and revisit the goat's hair. Now, a goat's hair was white. That's the first covering. That's the first covering that comes in. Now, we're... We're skipping this one because I'm going to go back and show you how this applies to these other three. This one, don't forget about it, is the fine twine linen. And we'll look at that in a minute. But that right there pictures the gospel. That pictures how you become a born-again believer. And it relates to all this down here. So we're going to revisit this next. But we're going to go over these first. So the goat's hair is the white covering. That's the first covering that comes in after this fine twine linen. What is that picture? That picture is the new birth. It's white. It's pure. It's sinless. It's the sinless inner man that is born again. Go to 1 John chapter 3. Let's see if I'm right. 1 John chapter 3. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. Right off the bat, you lose half your audience when you read this verse. Amen. <laughs> he that committed sin is of the devil. You just lost half your audience right there, brother, when you preach that. Amen. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. I hear people all the time say, I can't help myself. Yes, you can. You just don't want to do better. When you sin, you make a willful act to do it. Everybody in this building that sins, you're doing something and you already know it's wrong when you do it and you still do it anyway. Don't kid yourself and kid your grandmother. I mean, I know what's going on. That sin nature is on the inside of you and it's driving you to do something contrary to God, but when you do it, you know what you're doing. The Bible says, he that committed sins of the devil. And that just wiped out the whole population of America. Amen. So, God had to do something about that. 
God knows your situation. He knows you. He knows how vile you are. He knows how sinful that you are. He knows how evil you are. He knows how wicked you are. When he's talking to his disciples and his apostles, he said, ye, if ye being evil, he just took it for granted that we're evil. <laughs> he didn't say, now, if ye be evil. He said, ye being evil. He already told them, you know, you're evil. Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more shall the Father of light give you the Holy Ghost? That's in Luke. The Bible says here in verse 9, so God had to do something. What did he do? Look at verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Now, I've heard preachers try to explain that and dance around it, you know, try to sugarcoat it and water it down, you know, make it all pretty. So they, you know how they do it? They say this. Here's what they do. Well, he that don't practice sin. Ain't that pretty? <laughs> well, who don't practice sin? I mean, if you're not committing one thing, you're committing another. No, the Bible verse says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. So now we've got to figure out what he's talking about here because he cannot be talking about the flesh that you walk around in. If he's talking about the flesh that you and I walk around in, we're all doomed. Because everybody sins. Amen? Including the preacher. Alright, so what is he talking about? Well, the Bible says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. That's how you know he's not talking about practicing and he's talking about actually committing an act. Now, some people say, well, what does that mean, preacher? I'm glad you asked. I'll make you a short, quick, simple explanation. You're a body. You're a soul. Your spirit. Before you're saved, these three things here are connected. Whatever you commit in this body goes over into this soul and contaminates your spirit. Alright, and that's how you stand before God right now. You walk around in a live body and you have a dead spirit and you have a soul that is tainted, defiled, and sinful before God. So when God sees you, he identifies you by the sin that you are that is attached to you. So he's got you right there. Everything's interconnected. So when you get saved, what God has to do, the question becomes, what did God save when he saved you? Did he save your body or did he save your soul or did he save your spirit? Which one did he save? The first thing God does when He comes in and saves you is He saves you from yourself by doing a spiritual operation on you. He comes in with the scissors. And he spiritually circumcises you and cuts your body, this right here, this part that's defiled. He cuts it loose from this and this. When He cuts it loose, He puts a barrier here. And then He comes in with the Holy Spirit here and He wraps it his self around this part right here and puts a barrier there called the Holy Ghost. It's called the seal over in Ephesians chapter 1. And then he saves that spirit and he puts life into that soul and he washes that soul clean in the blood of Jesus Christ. And he makes him a new creature in the Lord. That soul becomes clean and that spirit becomes alive before God and that flesh is cut loose from that body uh, this part over here rather, and it can never come back in here and contaminate this part again. That's spiritual circumcision. And when God does that thing, this part over here that He saved can't sin. Your flesh sins. But your spirit man cannot sin. Because God is in there and He's wrapped around that thing and He won't allow it to. That's the spiritual operation. Yeah, that's right. You ever get a revelation on that, folks, it'll change your world. Amen. And I'm telling you, it interconnects with everything we study. Everything, you'll see me always refer back to this because it's always going to go back to that. Alright, so in that tabernacle, 
when he when he lays that goat's hair down and he puts that white hair on that thing and he lays it across there, it's picturing that new nature. It's picturing that sinless part of you that is not sinning before God, that cannot be contaminated by the dirt, the filth of the world. It is pure before God. And when God sees it, He sees Jesus Christ. Take your Bible, go to Ephesians chapter 3. Oh, have mercy. Where did the time go? All right, Ephesians chapter 3. I've got too many here to look at now. Ephesians chapter 3, look at verse 16. We'll look at this one and then we'll pick up there next week. Ephesians 3, 16 says this. He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Spirit. Where? That's the part of you got saved. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by what? That ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. You know what that's a reference to right there? Those measurements? The tabernacle. Because you know what He did in the tabernacle? He gave you the breadth. He gave you the length. He gave you the depth and He gave you the height. And He's likening you to that tabernacle that He's built. Or that temple. And to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you may be filled with all fullness of God. Now unto Him that is able to do exceedingly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end, Amen. Now, we'll pick up there next week. I got some more to say about that goat's hair and how it pictures the new birth, so we'll look at some more scriptures on it. But that thing is going to show you how you're saved. And that covering is in reference to you being a born again Christian. Gives you the gospel and gives you all that. Does anybody have any questions on this tonight? Didn't confuse anybody, did I? Did you understand everything we said so far, everybody? I mean, if you didn't, now let me know and I'll try to clarify it real quick. We're here. We still got to get these other two and then run back up here to this one. These coverings are deep. They are going to point you to some deep stuff about the Lord. And His working inside of you. He gave you a picture of the new birth in the tabernacle before it ever showed up. And He told you how He was going to do it. (laughs) It's amazing to me. Alright, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank You tonight for Your blessings tonight. Take these things we've studied out of Your Word. Hide them in our heart that we may not sin against Thee. Till we come together again, please, Lord, keep us safe. Keep us protected. Keep us covered. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, your goodness. And I just pray you'll be with each and every one. And may they grow in the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you tonight.